So valvular heart disease comprise, um, of course, the aortic valve, the mitral valve, and the right-sided valves. We are going to do the right-sided valves when we do right heart. So we're not going to do anything on tricuspid or uh, pulmonary valve or the pulmonic valve uh, under the heading of valvular heart disease. Uh, the right-sided heart valves are recovered on the uh, the right heart. Uh, so we're going to start with aortic stenosis. Um, and uh, so some background information on the aortic valve. <clears throat> um, well, before we get to that, uh, so when we talk about valvular heart disease, it's disease affecting the heart valves. And of course, as mentioned before, you know, you have the left-sided uh, heart valves, the aortic and mitral, which we're gonna cover under the banner of valvular heart disease. But the tricuspid and the pulmonic, we're gonna do those uh, when we do right heart. Valvular heart disease is very common. So if you, if you run an echo lab uh, or even in clinical practice, um, you know, disease of the heart valves are very common. And some of the signs and symptoms that uh, patients present with uh, leg edema, um, you know, because if, they, if the valvular heart disease uh, gives rise to increased pulmonary pressures, then you can get leg edema, you can get ascites, you can get uh, hepatomegaly, where the liver is enlarged and tender. Um, because the valves are affected, the, the, the normal laminar flow going to give rise to turbulence. <clears throat> so when you listen, you, you, you're going to get a murmur, and the murmur is because of turbulence. You know, the normal laminar flow don't give any significant uh, uh, sound, but once you have turbulence, then you're going to get murmur. So... If, if it's aortic stenosis or aortic insufficiency, you're going to get uh, specific murmurs relate, related to those uh, valvular conditions. Uh, tachycardia in a lot of uh, situations because you, you tend to get decreased cardiac output. And uh, one compensatory mechanism to increase cardiac output is increasing heart rate. So you'll get tachycardia. You, you know, third heart sound in, in older individuals uh, is a sign of heart failure. So if the patient um, is developing heart failure, you get a third heart sound and a fourth heart sound in, in some situations. So the symptoms include shortness of breath. And, uh, you know, if, if, if it's a, a left-sided valvular uh, pathology, you can get... Um, increase in, in, in uh, the, 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 the amount of uh, regurgitation of blood flowing back into the lungs, uh, you know, giving rise to alveolar edema, or you might have frank uh, congestive uh, uh, pulmonary. So you have shortness of breath. Fatigue, fatigue again, is related somewhat to the decreased cardiac output, uh, dizziness, um, you know, multifactorial dizziness can be multifactorial due to decreased cardiac output, um, or you know, if you have regurgitation and blood is going back into the cartilage, a patient can present with uh, dizziness. Syncope, especially with uh, aortic stenosis and mitral stenosis, because you have what we call a fixed cardiac output. And if anything demands an increase in cardiac output and the heart cannot deliver that, then the patients will, will pass out. So syncope, uh, passing out. Chest pains, uh, fairly common with patients with significant aortic stenosis um, because you, you tend to get what we call subendocardial ischemia. And then hemoptysis, the coughing up of blood, which is more common with mitral uh, more common mitral stenosis, and then palpitations, you know, if, if increase in heart rate, uh, as mentioned, 
which is a compensator mechanism. Sometimes you feel that as a, a fluttering. And you can get, uh, you know, it, premature beats. Again, your leg edema. And ascites is related to if you develop pulmonary hypertension, then you get a back off of back off of blood in the right side, increasing pressure in the right ventricular systolic pressure, the right atrial pressure, increased pressure in the 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 the, 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 the what we call the portal system. So you know everything going backwards, the pressure is going to increase. So you tend to get leg edema, ascites, murmur. When you listen to the patient, you get murmur related to the to the, the valvular pathology, uh, enlargement of the heart, cardiomegaly, hepatomegaly, because of the same mechanism, increase in pulmonary pressures, increase in right-sided pressures, uh, tachycardia, third and fourth heart sound. So those are some of the signs of you know valvular heart disease in general, and then you need to know the the sign the signs and symptoms related to specific valvular pathology. Uh, some of the more common cause for uh, valvular heart disease, rheumatic, uh, especially in tropical um, developing uh, countries. Uh, we don't see rheumatic much in, in um, developed uh, countries. Uh, uh, the, the cases that we see usually come from a developing uh, country. But um, you know, worldwide rheumatic heart disease is uh, uh, very common. Uh, congenital heart disease, bicuspid aortic valve, fairly common. Infective endocarditis, trauma to the different valve, especially the tricuspid valve, is very susceptible to trauma. You know, patient driving uh, in a motor vehicle accident, the steering wheel hit the chest. You can rupture the tricuspid uh, valvular apparatus, and that's fairly common. Tumors, tumors, um, you know, can 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 mimic and sometimes uh, uh, destroy the heart valves. Connective tissue disease, uh, myxomatous degeneration, so-called um, mitral valve prolapse, Barlow syndrome. <clears throat> and then how, how you treat uh, valvular heart disease, you know, when the patients are in extremis, patients are acutely ill, uh, you use medication, but medication is mainly for symptom relief. So you'll get the patient out of trouble, they're feeling better, but you, you will have to send them to have valve repair or valve uh, replacement. Okay. So you can repair the valve, depends on the valve and the pathology, you can repair it or replace the valve. So let, let's uh, look at um, aortic stenosis. Um, so the, the, when we say aortic stenosis, um, the opening of the aortic valve is restricted. So the normal uh, size of the aortic valve is about three to four centimeters squared. Five is, a, is stretching it. But um, the normal aortic um, valve orifice is, is about three to four centimeters squared. And, you know, when you look in the parasternal long axis view in a normal uh, heart, you, you know, you almost can't see the, 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 the valves because they're so thin. And when they open, they open and they go all the way back to the aortic wall. Okay, so once you have seen enough normal aortic valve, if, if the aortic valve is restricted, you, you automatically uh, sees that. Um, and if it's thickened, uh, calcified, then, you know, you can also see, see it as well. So when someone has a narrowing of the aortic valve, and it has to be significant narrowing, what are some of the signs and symptoms that is related to severe uh, narrowing of the, the aortic valve? So they'll have shortness of breath. First, they'll have shortness of breath with exertion when they exert themselves, because again, they, they have a fixed obstruction. So when you, the normal, when the normal uh, physiology is when you exert yourself, you increase the cardiac output. 
to, 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 to match the, the increased activity. But if you have a fixed obstruction, you, you, you cannot increase the cardiac output to match the activity. Um, and then, of course, the, 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 the left ventricular and diastolic pressure is going to go up. Your left atrial pressure will go up. And all the pressure going all the way backwards is going to increase. You get alveolar uh, edema. And patient will, will pre present with shortness of breath, with exertion. Syncope and sudden cardiac death. Syncope, again, is because they, it's a fixed obstruction. You cannot increase the cardiac output. So, if, you know, especially if they're exerting themselves, they'll pass out. You know, they'll pass out. And uh, the sudden, sudden cardiac death with your stenosis is usually arrhythmic, arrhythmogenic. So that, you know, they're prone to develop ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. So they'll present with sudden cardiac death. Chest pain because of um, subendocardial ischemia, um, so they will present with uh, chest pain. And then when you listen, the, the classic murmur of aortic stenosis, when you listen to the chest in, in the um, second right intercostal space or anywhere in the base of the heart, you'll get what we call an ejection systolic murmur, and it will radiate to the neck. So an ejection systolic murmur radiating to the neck. That's a, a classic, that's a classic uh, aortic stenotic murmur. Um, so the, 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 the cause for aortic stenosis you know, varies, but it depends on the presentation. So if a young individual presents with aortic uh, stenosis, you know, someone less than, say, 50 presents with aortic stenosis. It's going to be mo most likely due to a congenital problem. And the, the most common congenital problem is bicuspid aortic valve. So it depends on the, the, the age of the patient. So, you know, in an older individual, individual over 60, when if they present with uh, aortic stenosis, a lot of time it's senile degeneration. So, you know, see a lot of 70 and 80 year old uh, in the United States with aortic stenosis and it's senile degeneration. It's an aging process. The aortic valve become calcified and restricted and uh, they, they develop a uh, a significant aortic stenosis because of that. So, it's, so again, it's um, it, it depends on the age of the patient. The, the most likely case will vary with the age. Um, but in the United States, um, you know, by the, uh, the the contribution for, of bicuspid aortic valve to, to aortic stenosis is about thirty to forty percent of all the cases. Um, you know, the most common case, however, is uh, senile degeneration because, uh, you know, we have a lot of older individuals. So it's senile related or age related, um, then bicuspid aortic valve, acute rheumatic fever, endocarditis. So you can have other things that obstruct the, the aortic valve. And it's important for you to um, look because, you know, you we're talking about valvular heart disease but if you if a patient presents to you with um say shortness of breath uh syncope and chest pain you know those are the 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 the, the three common uh symptoms that someone with significant aortic stenosis is going to present uh, and, and, and when they present with those symptoms, then you know that the aortic stenosis is, is significant. So uh, shortness of breath, chest pain, and syncope. So those are three uh, uh, symptoms that suggest severe aortic stenosis. <clears throat> so, you know, patient present with, with say, all three symptoms. When you listen to the chest, 
you get an ejection systolic murmur uh, radiating to the neck. You know, we're talking about valvular heart, a valvular, uh, valvular aortic stenosis, but you can have subvalvular pathology and supravalvular pathology. So you're not going to know which one you're dealing with until you look. So, you know, if, if the patient have a murmur of aortic stenosis, it could be a subvalvular problem, which means that you have an obstruction below the aortic valve, call that subvalvular, or you can have an obstruction above the aortic valve, I would call that supravalvular. So we have separate session to discuss those, but bear that in mind. So it's important for you to look because if you do your echo and you get a parasternal long axis that looks like this, you, are, you, you know somewhat for sure that it's a valvular aortic stenosis because you're going to look at the valve and you have seen enough normal cases that you know that this valve is thick, it's restricted, okay? When you look at your ECG, you see that you are in systole. Okay, but the aortic valve is the, the valve is not fully open, so there is restricted motion of the aortic valve and it's thickened. Okay, so just simple observation is important. Again, you know, if you look and you see, you might see an obstruction. Um, are narrowing at the subvalvular area. So this is the area, this is the subvalvular area. So if you see something here and the, the valve leaflet looks fine, then you're talking about a subvalvular pathology. If the valve looks fine, subvalvular area looks okay, and you have a restriction in the supravalvular area, then you're talking about a supravalvular pathology, and we'll discuss those in, in due to course. All right. So, if the if 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 you look and the the valve looks thickened and the motion is restricted somewhat, then you know you have to go on to measure the left ventricular flow tract diameter. Okay, we have been we went over this when we did hemodynamics. So the next step is to calculate the aortic valve area. So you're going to need to get uh, you need to need to get a few things in order to calculate the aortic valve area. And one of them is the left ventricle flow tract diameter, okay? Um, so the left ventricle flow tract diameter is one. Then the next thing you need to do is to get well, you can look in your short axis. You just look to make sure it's restricted, and the aortic valve looks like that. So you need to go to your, when you do your M mode, your M mode for a normal aortic valve, you can see you have thin structures in systole. The valve opens, thin structures. You have good separation, cusp separation, and, um, when you, in, if, if, if it's an aortic stenotic patient, then you can see the thickened valve and the, the reduced cusp separation. And then when you do your five chamber view, five chamber view, you want to get your, so with the five chamber view, you're going to get your left ventricle flow tract TVI. Remember that they, they, the, the, the things you need to calculate your aortic valve area, you need your diameter, you need the left ventricular flow tract TVI, and you, you need your aortic valve TVI. So you don't want to put your cursor too close to the valve because if you put the, the, this, the, 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 cur the sample volume too close to the valve, you're going to get turbulence and your LVOT TVI is going to be too high. So you want to back off a little bit where you have laminar flow, and then you do your, your LVOT TVI, um, okay? 
so you also so you all you're gonna go into the valve you're gonna go into the aortic valve and you use C doubler now so you're gonna use continuous wave doppler and get your aortic valve TVI you're not only gonna get your aortic valve TVI but you're gonna get your peak gradient and your mean gradient okay peak gradient and mean gradient so when we did or and you want to do it from multiple windows remember because it's a Doppler technique it's a Doppler technique and it's susceptible to, 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 to angle so you know it's angle dependent you want to get the ultrasound beam as parallel to the blood flow as possible and the only way to to, 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 to achieve that is to do to do your assessment from multiple windows okay uh, in this example this is a five chamber view you can see your you get a mean gradient of 33.8 when you do it um, this is your apical three uh, chamber window you get a mean gradient of 13.5 so it's all because of angle and when you do what we call peed off so this is uh, this is uh, a non-imaging probe you get a mean gradient of 61 so again it's angle dependent so you have to do your assessment from multiple windows okay multiple windows and then the formula you have to use your continuity equation formula okay again the flow the flow across the left ventricular flow track is going to be the same as the flow across the aortic valve so the flow across the flow across the left ventricular flow track is going to equal to the flow across the aortic valve the flow across the left ventricle flow track is equal to the area of the left ventricle flow track times the TVI of the left ventricle flow track. And the flow across the aortic valve equals the aortic valve area times the TVI across the aortic valve area, uh, TVI across the aortic valve. Okay? You want to calculate the aortic valve area, so you just rearrange your equation and you solve for your aortic valve area okay so again the area the area of the left ventricle flow track pi r square when you simplify pi r square you get 0.785 times d squared and then you multiply it by the tvi across the left ventricle flow track okay so again the area of the left ventricle flow track, assume it's circular, pi r squared, pi is 3.14, uh, radius is diameter over 2, you square that, you get diameter square over 4, so you're left with 0.785. So to calculate the aortic valve area, it is equal to 0.785 times d squared times the TVI across the left ventricle flow track divided by the TVI across the aortic valve. So you have to you have to know the formula. You have to memorize the formula, but more importantly, you have to know how the formula is derived. You know, and we have been we we went over this uh, in hemodynamic session, and then now in the valvular heart disease session. So you have to remember this formula okay because you at the patient bedside and you do your stuff you have to be able to quickly calculate the valve area to determine if it's uh severe aortic stenosis yes or no so again you're going to interrogate the aortic valve from multiple windows because 
we're using Doppler technique. Doppler technique is angle dependent. So you wanna look, you wanna use your apical five chamber view, apical three chamber view, right parasternal uh, view, super sternal notch view, and you also wanna use your pencil probe, okay? Using the pencil probe is, 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 uh, is an ICAL recommendation, okay? You have to use the pencil probe, the imageless probe, okay? You want to get the maximum velocity, and the only way to, to, to get your maximum velocity is by interrogating the valve from multiple windows. All right, so this is what you need to know. And this is uh, the current guideline for um, determining the severity of, um, uh, of uh, the aortic valve. So let's do severe aortic stenosis because you have to remember this, okay? So there are a number of things you look at, okay? So we, we, we talk about uh, aortic sclerosis, we talk about mild aortic stenosis, moderate aortic stenosis, and severe aortic stenosis. The things that you're going to look at is your aortic jet velocity. You're going to look at the mean gradient. You're going to look at the aortic valve area using the continuity equation. You're going to look at the aortic valve index, aortic valve index, and this is what we call the dimensionless ratio, or you can call it velocity ratio. Okay, so for severe aortic stenosis, if the velocity, the aortic jet velocity is more than four meters per second square, it is suggestive of severe aortic stenosis. So the velocity, so you put your cursor across the aortic valve and you press C doubler, and if the velocity, the peak velocity now, if it's more than four meters per second squared, then the mean gradient, remember, when you do your C doubler, it's also going to give you the peak velocity. It's, an, it's going to give you the mean gradient. Mean gradient of 40 millimeters mercury. 40 millimeters mercury is suggestive of severe aortic stenosis. Valve area less than or equal to one centimeter squared is suggestive. And then... Index aortic valve less than or equal to 0.6 centimeter squared per meter squared. Remember, when you index something, you divide by the body surface area. And then the velocity ratio. What this is, this is just the LVOT TVI divided by the aortic valve TVI. And if it's less than 0.25, it suggests severe aortic stenosis. What happened is, Sometimes when you do your studies, the the um, when you do your studies, the two D images are not very clear. Okay, you 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 get suboptimal images, and uh, you know you cannot get that diameter accurately. You know, because remember, if you if you get a two, if the the diameter is too large, you're gonna so you, you you know when you get your 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 radio, you're gonna square your diameter you square your diameter so you're gonna square the arrow you're gonna make the arrow even much larger so sometimes it's not feasible to to use the continuity equation because of suboptimal images but you can do what we call the dimensionless index because you're gonna use your LVOT TVI divided by the aortic valve TVI. And if that's less than 0.25, then it suggests severe aortic stenosis. For mild, for mild aortic stenosis, if the velocity, peak velocity across the aortic valve is between 2.6 and 2.9, that's suggestive. If the mean gradient across the valve is less than 20, then it's suggestive of mild aortic stenosis. If the valve area is greater than 1.5, it suggests mild aortic stenosis. If the index 
is greater than 0.85. Remember, the index is just the aortic valve area divided by the body surface area. And then if your dimensionless index is greater than 0.5, this is also suggestive of, of mild uh, stenosis. And then anything that falls in between mild and severe is moderate. Okay, But again, these uh, findings uh, is in addition to thickened and calcified and restricted aortic valve. So you're going to see that. And then if the velocity is less than or equal to 2.5 meters per second square, and if the valve is a little bit thickened and calcified, then that's what we call aortic sclerosis. Remember, aortic sclerosis is going to give you the same type of murmur as your aortic uh, stenosis. You're going to get that ejection systolic murmur. But when you do your hemodynamic assessment, the, the velocity is less than 2.5 meters per second, okay? And if you do valve area, it's going to be much greater than 2 uh, centimeters squared. The reason why we have, in bracket, these numbers here, is these are the older criteria. So the older criteria, we used to use 50 um, for severe, that's mean gradient, and uh, for, for, for mild, less than 30. But the current criteria for severe aortic stenosis, the mean gradient is not the peak gradient, mean gradient greater than 40 millimeters mercury. Okay. All right, so you have to memorize this because you're going to get, you're going to get scenarios whether you're taking care of patients um, and you're going to get values and you have to know how to interpret these values. The, you know, is it mild, moderate, or severe uh, stenosis? So you have to know that. Um, and then in exams, you commonly get asked, you know, is this severe? And they they, they 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 want you to know the, the, the criteria for severe aortic stenosis. So this is probably even more important than the others. You have to know what constitute severe aortic stenosis. Again, the velocity greater than four meters per second, mean gradient greater than 40 millimeters mercury, valve area less than or equal to one centimeter squared the index less than or equal to 0 0.6, and the dimension less index less than 0.25. All right, so that is aortic stenosis. We're going to quickly go over aortic insufficiency. So aortic insufficiency is, uh, so aortic stenosis is, uh, it, it's going to impact the patient in systole. Aortic insufficiency is a diastolic phenomenon so in diastole, when the aortic valve is supposed to close shut, prevents blood from going backwards from the, the aorta into the left ventricular flow tract and into the LV, the aortic valve is somewhat incompetent and it allows blood to flow backwards from the aorta into the left ventricle. So this is the definition of aortic insufficiency. The backflow of blood from the aorta into the left ventricle. It's a diastolic phenomenon. Okay, so the signs and symptoms of uh, aortic insufficiency, uh, uh, you get shortness of breath, uh, you know, which is usually if you have any significant heart pathology, you know, shortness of breath, usually the initial stage is going to be exertional. When it's, when it's real bad, then you get um, shortness of breath at rest, and you'll get what we call orthopnea, PND, uh, those things. So shortness of breath with aortic insufficiency, palpitations. Uh, you can get chest pains as well, third heart sounds, and the classic murmur of aortic insufficiency. When you, when you listen at the left sternal border, you get what we call a blowing diastolic murmur, blowing diastolic murmur. Okay, so that's classic. Um, those of you who are interested in 
knowing all the murmurs. We have a lecture that um, covers all the murmurs, um, all the valvular pathologies. So let me know if you're interested in, in, in reviewing that. But uh, go over all the murmurs and uh, the features of these murmurs and other sounds, other heart sounds. OK, so with aortic insufficiency, uh, these are some of the cause for aortic insufficiency, aortic root dilatation from whatever cause. Uh, you know, if you have what we call uh, medial necrosis, where the, 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 the media of the, the aorta is defective, it can dilate, okay? It can dilate, and, you know, morphine syndrome patients um, usually have these features, aortic root dilatation. So it's, it pulls the valves apart, so the valves do not co-op properly, so you get uh, aortic regurgitation. Syphilitic aortitis, not very common anymore, but um, it, the valves become thickened and retracted somewhat, so you, the, the co-optation is not there, so you get aortic insufficiency. Aortic dissection, you know, when you have a rupture in the wall of the aorta, goes all the way backwards and prevent the aortic valve from closing properly. Hypertension can also do it. Bicuspid aortic valve not only cause aortic stenosis, but you can get aortic insufficiency. Um, and then rheumatic fever. Uh, uh, you can, if you have rheumatic uh, aortic valve in, in involvement, you can get regurgitation and stenosis less commonly. Endocarditis. So if you have a vegetation on the aortic valve, it's going to prevent proper closure of the aortic valve. So you get um, regurgitation. Um, we had um, obesity medications a few years ago that um, um, OK, so let, let's just, OK, so the dimensionless index is you know what what the the unit the unit of um so so whatever is going to affect the lvot tvi is probably going to affect the aortic valve tvi as well so the, the the question was why don't we divide the dimensionless index by the body surface area? I mean, if we put the body surface area in the numerator and the denominator, it's going to cancel out each other. Or if you want to say you divide the, 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 the dimensionless index with the body surface area, I mean, you know, it's not going to give you any additional information then because whether it's a small patient or a big patient, the dimensionless index, index is, is, is going to give you the same information. So you're not going to glean any additional information if you, if you divide by body surface area. All right, so continuing with aortic insufficiency, uh, we had obesity medications a few years ago, and they were pulled because they were causing valvular pathology. And one of the valvular pathology was aortic insufficiency. We had the so-called FENFEN. Um, there was a lot of lawsuits really, uh, related to those medications. Morphine syndrome, as we discussed earlier, where you have dilatation of the aortic root, and you can have aortic, um, you can have uh, aortic dissection from in these morphine um, syndrome. Erla-Danler syndrome, the so-called so hyperflexibility uh, syndrome. So these individuals can twist in all different um, positions. And one of the things they have is aortic root dilatation and aortic insufficiency. Ankylosing spondylitis and lupus can also give you aortic insufficiency. So when you evaluate in a patient with um, aortic insufficiency. This is our parasternal long axis view. Uh, this is a diastolic frame where the um, aortic valve is closed or supposed to be closed, but because it's incompetent, you have blood flowing across the aortic valve 
into the left ventricular flow tract and into the left ventricle. Your transducer is right there. This blood is flowing away from the transducer. Blood is flowing away from the transducer and that's why it's blue. It's uh, probably going to be more mosaic because of the turbulence. Because remember, when you get turbulence, it's a mosaic flow. But it's going to be mainly more blue than, much, much more blue than red because it's flowing away from the transducer. One of the things that you want to do, you want to measure the width of the jet. Okay, that is one method of assessing the severity of aortic insufficiency. You measure the AI, the width of the AI, okay? And you compare it to the width of the left ventricle flow track. So the width of the AI jet as compared to the width of the left ventricle flow track. For mild aortic insufficiency, that ratio is less than 25%. For severe aortic insufficiency, that ratio is greater than 65%. So you measure the, the left ventricular flow tract diameter, and you measure the diameter of the regurgitant jet. And the ratio is the, the important thing. So if that ratio is less than 25%, it's mild, mild aortic insufficiency. If that ratio is greater than or equal to 65%, then it's severe. All right. Another method of assessing aortic insufficiency is the pressure half-time method. So either in the apical five-chamber view or the apical three-chamber view, you look at your AI jet, and this is what your a aortic jet looks like on Doppler. Okay, your ECG is on top, systole is from the onset of the QRS to the end of the T wave, diastole is from the end of the T wave to the QRS. So in diastole, you get this Doppler envelope and you measure the slope. Okay, uh, if you measure the slope all the way down, you'll get the, your, what we call the deceleration time. Remember that. Your pressure half time, pressure half time is equal to 0.25 times, sorry, 0.29 times the deceleration time. So you're interested in the deceleration time, deceleration time. And mild aortic insufficiency, your deceleration time is greater than 500 milliseconds with severe, or sorry, your pressure half time. So the pressure half time in mild AI is greater than 500 milliseconds. With severe AI, your pressure half time is less than 200 milliseconds. And not only you're going to look at your pressure half time, but you're going to look at the density. The more blood flowing backwards, the more dense your CW envelope. So, so this looks fairly faint. So this is more this is most likely mild. Very dense, suggests there's a lot of blood going backwards. Okay, so, so if you, so these are some, some features of, uh, or some features to, to, to define the severity of the AI. So in the, the top, in the top uh, panel, mild aortic insufficiency, if you do your pressure half time, it's going to be greater than 500. You can see that this is not very dense. It's not very dense. A very important um, feature is to look at your descending aorta. So your supersternal notch, you put your cursor uh, at the descending aorta, and you get a nice... Uh, uh, systolic uh, flow in the descending aorta. Okay, again, if you can just put it in your mind's eye, remember in the descending aorta, you wait, if you put your cursor there, 
the, the blood is flowing away from the transducer. So your, your envelope is going to be below the baseline. Okay. So these are features of mild aortic insufficiency as opposed to severe aortic insufficiency. When you measure the AI jet as compared to the outflow track, that's greater than, greater than or equal to 65%. When you look at your CW envelope, it's very dense, very steep. Your pressure half time, less than 200. And more importantly, when you look at your descendant aorta, okay, you get your nice systolic flow below the baseline, but you get what we call an older diastolic flow reversal. Older diastolic flow reversal. And when you do the TVI, TVI of this, okay, you just trace it. It's, it's, it, it will be greater than 13 centimeters. So these are features of severe AI, mild AI, okay? You measure the diameter, the density of the envelope, pressure half time, and then with your descending aorta, all the diastolic flow reversal and the TVI greater than 13 centimeters. With um, AI, it's, it, it, it's also important that you use the, the, the PISA method to evaluate your aortic insufficiency. Again, remember PISA is the proximal isovelocity surface area. And these are the features, the piece of uh, 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 features of severe AI. The vena contractor, and so you have to revert back to what we did when we did PISA. The vena contractor is usually greater than 0.6 centimeters for severe AI. So for severe aortic insufficiency, the vena contract is greater than 0.6 centimeters. For mild AI, the vena contract is less than 0.3. When you do your EROA, effective regression orifice area, with severe AI, that EROA is greater than or equal to 0.3 centimeters squared. With mild AI, it's less than 0.1. And then when you look at regurgitant volume, for severe AI, the volume is greater than or equal to 60 mLs. For mild, it's less than 30. And then the regurgitant fraction, for severe AI, it's greater than or equal to 50%. For mild, it's less than 30%. So these numbers you also have to know because any type of um, exam is going to ask you these questions, okay? So you also have to know this table because for you to, to, for you to determine the severity of uh, AI, okay, these uh, features have to be met. So for severe AI, we're talking about a cent central jet and the width, so we just went over this, central jet with the width greater than or equal to 65% of the LVOT diameter, okay? We just went over that. So that would make it severe AI. The vena contractor using the PISA method uh, greater than 0.6 centimeters, okay? Pressure half time, less than 200 milliseconds. And then when you do your uh, supersternal notch, you get all the diastolic aortic flow reversal in the descendant aorta. And in addition to that, the TVI should be greater than 13 centimeters. Okay? Because you, if you have significant AI, you're going to get moderate or, or greater than moderate LV enlargement. The LV is going to dilate. Regurgitant volume is going to be greater than or equal to 60 mLs. Regurgitant fraction is going to be greater or equal to 50%. And then the EROA, effective regurgitant orifice area, is going to be more than or equal to 0.3 centimeter squared. For mild AI, central jet width less than 25% of the LVOT, 
vena contractor less than 0.3 centimeters. When you look at your abdominal, uh, so your descending aorta, you get uh, you're not going to get any older diastolic flow reversal. Pressure half time greater than 500 milliseconds. LV size is normal. The RV volume, regurgitant volume, it's regurgitant volume less than 30. Regurgitant fraction less than 30. EROA less than 0.1. So we went over hemodynamics in detail so that you guys understand what we talk about when we talk about regurgitant volume, regurgitant fraction, uh, and uh, the, the, the different features of uh, the, the, the piece. Okay, so you have to know this table as well. Okay, because any exam in ECHO is going to test you on this. And not only that, but when you're evaluating your patients, you need to know whether they have mild, moderate, or severe aortic insufficiency. Because if someone presents with symptoms and you have AI, you have to know, is it the AI which is causing the symptoms or something else? You know, if they have severe AI and they present with symptoms, it's probably the AI which is causing the symptoms. So uh, you have to know the assessment for mild, moderate, and se severe AS and, um, and uh, AI. So that concludes... Um, that concludes assessment of the aortic valve.